You know, every year the Nobel Prize in Physics honors some incredible discovery that totally reshapes how we see the universe. But the 2025 prize, well, this one feels different. This isn't just about understanding the cosmos. This is about the exact moment we learned how to build with its weirdest, most ghostly rules. This is the story of the ghost in the machine. Take a look at this. This is a quantum computer. It doesn't run on ones and zeros like your phone or your laptop. No, it operates on a completely different set of principles, the bizarre, ghostly rules of the quantum universe. And the only reason this machine exists is because of the one key discovery we're about to dive into. So that's the big question, right? For decades, physicists knew that the rules for tiny little things like atoms were just strange. But how in the world did we learn to take that strangeness and build actual machines with it? I mean, how do you engineer a ghost? Well, the people who figured it out were John Clark, Michel de Bore, and John Martinis. The Royal Swedish Academy gave them the Nobel for, get this, macroscopic quantum mechanical tunneling and energy quantization in an electric circuit. Okay, that is a mouthful, but what does it actually mean? Put simply, they figured out how to build a man-made circuit that behaved like a single, giant atom, complete with all its quantum weirdness. Okay, so to really get what they accomplished, we first have to understand the massive problem they were trying to solve. Think of it like the universe has two different rule books. We're going to look at that huge gap between our world and the seriously weird quantum realm. This slide just lays it out perfectly. In our world, the classical world, if you want to get a ball over a hill, you have to give it enough of a push to roll over the top. Simple. Predictable. But in the quantum world, a particle isn't really a solid thing. It's more like a wave of possibilities. And because of that, it can do something impossible. It can just ghost or tunnel straight through the hill. It's playing by a totally different set of rules. And that led to the million-dollar question for experimental physics at the time. Could these bizarre rules, like tunneling, actually be coaxed into showing up in big, tangible systems that we can build and control? Or was the quantum world just going to be forever locked away at the scale of single atoms, totally out of our reach? Answering a question that big, well, it required a very specific team. A perfect storm of different talents, really. So let's meet the architects of the quantum, the three laureates who came together to engineer a brand new reality. First up, you've got John Clark, the meticulous mentor. His entire career at Berkeley was basically a relentless war on experimental noise. We're talking stray radio waves, tiny vibrations, anything and everything that could mess up an experiment. He was the steady hand, the one who created the perfectly silent, pristine stage needed for the quantum show to even have a chance to begin. Then you have Michel Dvorat, the theoretical visionary. He was the one who brought the theoretical boldness, constantly asking those deep what-if questions. He was brilliant at connecting their incredibly delicate measurements to the fundamental principles of physics, seeing the true cosmic importance in what they were finding. And finally, there was John Martinez, the pragmatic engineer. Back then, he was a grad student, and he was the hands-on builder. You know, if Clark demanded a silent stage and Dvorak wrote the script, Martinez was the guy who actually built the actors and the set. He was the one who physically took these abstract designs and turned them into a working piece of hardware, tuning it, rebuilding it, and tweaking it over and over until it was absolutely perfect. So what was in their quantum toolkit? Well, they started with superconductivity. That's a state where electricity flows with zero resistance, and it let them get billions of electrons to act in perfect unison, like a single giant quantum object. Then they used something called a Josephson junction, which is basically a tiny engineered weak spot in the circuit, to act as a quantum gate, creating that energy barrier they needed to test. Their whole mission was to use this setup to prove two things. First, that ghostly quantum tunneling, and second, energy quantization the final unmistakable signature that they had built an artificial atom. All right, let's get to the experiments themselves. This is where it all came together in the 1980s. This is the story of how they built an atom that you could quite literally hold in your hand. Now, the challenge here was just immense. I mean, they had to build this tiny superconducting circuit and cool it down to just a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. We're talking colder than deep space. And then they had to shield it from literally all external noise. They basically had to create one of the quietest, coldest places in the entire universe, just so they could hear the faint whisper of the quantum world. 
So they build this incredible, intricate setup. But how do you actually prove that something tunneled? I mean, how do you catch a ghost in the act? What was the smoking gun they were looking for? And this is where their genius really shines. See, in the classical world, the circuit should only be able to escape its little energy trap if it gets a kick from heat. So as you cool it down toward absolute zero, the escape rate should drop and drop and drop to nothing. But that is not what they saw. The circuit did escape, and as they got colder and colder, the escape rate flattened out. It became constant. That flat line on the graph, that was the smoking gun. An escape that doesn't care about temperature can only be quantum tunneling. They had caught their ghost. This table just lays out their two incredible findings so well. As you can see in that top row for tunneling, what they observed completely contradicted what classical physics expected. But they didn't stop there. Check out the second row on quantization. They decided to zap the circuit with microwaves. Now classically, it should have just absorbed that energy at any old frequency. But instead, it only absorbed energy and escaped at very specific, discrete frequencies. It was like a radio locking onto a single station. And that was the final proof. It had distinct energy levels. They had, without a doubt, built a true artificial atom. Now, here's the crucial point. This wasn't just some cool physics experiment that ends up in a textbook. No, this was the dawn of quantum engineering. Let's take a look at how their work in a Berkeley lab in the 1980s literally created the future we're living in now. You see those two energy levels they measured? The lowest energy level, the ground state, and that first excited state? Well, that's what we now call a qubit. It's the fundamental building block of a quantum computer. The ground state is the zero, and that first excited state is the one. Their circuit wasn't just an artificial atom. It was the world's first prototype of a superconducting qubit. What's so amazing is you can draw a direct line from their work to today. In 1985, they demonstrate their circuit. By 1999, the first real superconducting qubit is built, directly using their methods. And then... Fast forward to 2019, who leads the Google team that claims quantum advantage with their Sycamore chip? John Martinez, the same pragmatic engineer from the original team now scaling up the very same ideas. It's a straight line from their lab to the quantum revolution. But this wasn't just about building computers, not by a long shot. The incredible sensitivity of these circuits led to devices called squids, which are now some of the world's most sensitive magnetic detectors used for things like mapping human brain activity. And the physics they perfected is so precise that the Josephson Junction now officially defines the legal standard for the volt. Their work became foundational for everything from medicine to international standards. This quote right here really just sums up their ultimate legacy. It marks the point where quantum mechanics matured from a science of observation into a true discipline of engineering. Think about that. They didn't just look at the quantum world. They gave us the blueprints to actually build with it. So when you boil it all down, what's the ultimate takeaway here? This Nobel Prize, it really represents a fundamental shift in our relationship with the quantum world. It's a shift from just asking, what is it? to finally, for the first time, being able to ask, what can we build with it? You know, before this work, that line between our big, predictable, classical world and the weird, tiny quantum world, it seemed like a rigid, uncrossable wall. What Clark, Deveret, and Martinez proved is that it's not a wall at all. It's a controllable boundary. They showed us that with enough care and enough ingenuity, we can reach across that divide and start engineering with the rules on the other side. And that's really the thought that leaves us with. Their discovery gave us the tools to engineer the quantum world, and that has led to machines that are just now, today, beginning to change our lives. The question is no longer if we can build with these bizarre rules. The question now is, what's next? What mysteries are we going to solve now that we finally have the key?